Hey everybody, this is Vince Miller. So glad to be with you today. Today our topic is how to rise above the rhetoric. Now before we dive in today, do me a favor right now, hit that subscribe button below so you can get notified when new videos come out in this series or any series. I think you'll appreciate it. Also, uh, do me another favor, head over to the website today at some point in your day. It's beresolute.org, beresolute.org. And while you're over there, check out our resources, but also check out our daily devotional. It is always short, sweet, to the point. You can get it right in your email inbox each day. And with that, let's dive into our message for today, how to rise above the rhetoric. Now, fellas, we live in some interesting and tense times, don't we? <laughs> this is a time in our day that has divided our country and our world on all kinds of issues. And we have politicized just about everything which has resulted in all kinds of problems for us. It has divided families, relationships, friendships, parties, and even churches. You know, just this week I was reading a post online <laughs> and what followed this post was, well, one jab after another after another, and honestly, it was somewhat disheartening to read. And I, like you, I'm trying to figure out how to rise above all this, how we can be good citizens of our time and good stewards of God's truth, rising above all the noise of this rhetoric in our world today. So in thinking about this, knowing it's gotten a little tricky out there, <laughs> I've been searching God's word for ways to respond so that I can live above all this noise. So today I'm going to share with you five things that I'm doing to rise above the rhetoric. And I'm hoping that maybe one or two of these things will really speak to you and equip you to live out your calling as a follower of Jesus Christ. Here's number one. You gotta watch your words. You gotta watch what you say, your words. Here's what Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruits. Now this proverb says two things result from words, right? First, death and second, life. And we have to remember that the muscle of our mouth, the tongue, well, it has real power. It can be life-taking or actually life-giving. You know, many of time I have said things in my home to maybe my wife or my kids that I regret. I remember a couple of times in anger saying some things I still regret to this day. What's also true is I remember things that they have said to me as well. <laughs> I remember them like they were yesterday. And I remember the exact statement that was said, how they said it, and where we were when it was said. And today, of course, I've normalized and gotten over some of these things and moved past the hurt. But the fruits of those words live on. And this is the point of the proverb. Words have fruit. They have this lasting impact, right? And sometimes these words linger forever. In fact, there's one moment in my life that I will never forget for as long as I live. It was an argument I heard between my bio mother and my bio father. I was at the point in life where my parents were divorced, and yet I wanted to see my dad more. And I begged my mother one day to talk to my father about it. Well, one day she did politely confront him, very kindly, and I heard them talking. It resulted in an argument, and I heard the end of the argument, and it scarred me significantly. My dad said this, I don't want to spend more time with him. You spend more time with him. Now those words were powerful because they still echo in my life today. They affected me as a son, they've affected me as a father, and as a husband, and a friend. And there are moments today that I still recall the pain of that. Do you see the fruit? Yet on the other hand, words can have the same effect in the other direction as well. <laughs> they can be very positive. I know that positive words can alter a person's future. A kind word spoken to me by maybe a family member or friends or followers fuels me for days and weeks on end. And I'm sure it does you as well. And so we need to remember that our tongue has fruit. The things that we say has a fruit and our words have an impact on the life of others. 
I'm trying to remember this as I rise above all the rhetoric in the world. Now, here's number two. Don't conform your mind. <laughs> Don't conform your mind. Here's a classic verse that many of you have heard many times before. It's Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, this classic verse is so practical and applicable right now. Today, information is being used to persuade and transform our minds in hopes of conforming not just our thoughts, but our attitudes and our actions. The world is working hard to persuade us to conform to their ideas and ideals and ideologies. <laughs> and this is happening everywhere. It's happening in our businesses and in media and education, just about everywhere. What's most concerning is that unsuspecting minds, sometimes even young minds, are being intentionally indoctrinated with information that is actually in direct opposition with God's will and what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, let's agree that there's nothing wrong with being informed, but we should take care that in our informing, we're not conforming, right? And this is hard work. It's hard to not let certain information affect our attitudes and actions. It's especially hard work when we're taking in unreasonable quantities of information from the world and we don't counterbalance it with equal quantities of God's truth. Because the law of quantity will always win. The more we are informed with the world's way, and the less we're informed with God's way, the world is going to win every single time. So let's get practical about it. If we really want to be more conformed to the will of God, then we need to do two very simple things. Here they are. Number one, spend less time being informed by the world. Second, spend more time being informed by God then you're on the path to conforming to God's will and what is good and acceptable and perfect. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do right now with all the rhetoric going on is spend more time in God's word. Here's number three. We gotta learn to speak up rightly. We gotta speak up rightly. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter four, verse two. This is a classic charge, right? He says, preach the word. Be ready, in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Now, in this text, Paul himself is actually exhorting Timothy to speak so that he will not shy away from opportunities to preach the truth in those moments that truth is needed. And there will be a day that you will be called to speak up. You will be so inundated with messages of untruth that God will prompt you to speak up and to speak out. For some, this is going to be risky. This is because we might have to risk a resource or a relationship when we speak. And with this, we're going to have to weigh the value of these resources and relationship with the cost of speaking the truth. Therefore, we need to ready ourselves for the moment that it happens because Guess what? It's going to happen. <laughs> we are each given God-ordained moments, every one of us. And in these moments, we're going to have to do one of three things when we speak up. Either reprove, rebuke, or exhort. <laughs> this is because by nature, truth reproves and rebukes and exhorts. That's its job. Not our job. Its job. It does its own work. We are just a mouthpiece for the truth. But when the time comes for us to speak up, we do control two things. How we say it and what we say. In fact, Paul tells us how to say it and what to say. He says to speak it patiently here in this text and let it do the teaching. <laughs> I think what is hard about these moments when we speak up is making sure we regulate our well, our personal passion from a humble position so that people can really see and hear the heart behind the reprove and the rebuke and the exhortation of truth in their life. We have to avoid being self-righteous and maybe even sometimes overpassionate. 
We don't own the truth, therefore we cannot weaponize it. We must remember that we too are actively being transformed by the truth. And therefore, as a steward of the truth, we are carrying the truth patiently, letting it teach and letting it do the reproving, rebuking, and exhorting. And this is something I'm trying to remember as I'm rising above all the rhetoric in this world. Here's number four. You got to stop living in fear. We got to stop living in fear. Here is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It reads this way. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. You know, I love these words here because there is so much fear in the world today. We have actually been sold a propaganda of fear, have we not? Just look around at people the next time you're out and about. Fear is just prevalent. You can see it in people's eyes. But here's what I don't understand. Why so many Christians have bought into this doctrine of fear. We should be the most fearless group of people on planet Earth. We should have no fear of job loss or poverty or suffering or sickness, past, future judgment, evil, the devil, even death. No fear. The scripture tells us over and over and over again that we should not fear one of these things, but only one thing, God. Paul in this text declares that we, followers of Christ, have been given a spirit not of fear, not of fear. And you know what fear results in? Fear results in powerlessness, hateful attitudes, and out-of-control lives. But God's spirit in us is one of power, love, and self-control. One that will give us power when we actually feel powerless, love when we feel hated by the world, control when life is out of control, and therefore we should hold our heads up high. Not in arrogance, but godly confidence, fearlessly, knowing that we fear the one God who fears nothing. So this, again, is just one thing I'm trying to do to live above all the rhetoric is to rise above the fear itself. And here's number five. You got to pray when you're anxious. You got to pray when you're anxious. Here's Philippians chapter four, verse six. It reads this way. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You know, with so much anxiety in the world, we just cannot go wrong with prayer. But we often go wrong because we don't go to prayer, right? We fail to go to prayer first. But here's where we go first. Here's where I go first. (laughs) I go first to frustration or first to anger or first to outburst or first to ruminating on it or first to complaining or first to posting or first to figuring out my own solutions or first to siding with or against people or positions or players or a president or politicians, but not to a higher power in prayer. And I got to preach this to myself too, because I'm guilty of this one as well. But the commandment in this text is to go first to prayer in everything. It's a call to make our requests known to the one who can actually resolve all the issues we have been frustrated with, angry about, ruminating on, posting on, and trying to resolve on our own. You see, we as believers have a God who is in control and has power over all things and who is eager actually to hear our prayers. And he wants us to ask, right? (laughs) So here's the question. Are you asking? Very simply, are you asking? If not, you need to. You need to go to God and let him answer his way and in his time and trust that he will because he will. So let's rise above all this rhetoric together. (laughs) It's exhausting. Try doing one of these five things today, right? Watch your words. Don't conform your mind to the world. Speak uprightly. Stop living in fear and pray when you feel anxious. And join me in a journey of trying to figure out how do we rise above all this rhetoric in our lives. Love you guys. Thanks for joining me today. See you right back here next time. Till then, live all in for him who lived all in for you.